Boom. Okay. Shelby, for like the two people who don't know you on this call, do you want to give like a super quick intro of who you are? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm Shelby Miller. I'm a physical therapist out of Fort Worth, Texas. Um, born and raised in Fort Worth. Went to undergrad at Texas A&M and then went to PT school out in West Texas at Hart and Simmons. Um, just graduated at the end of 2017. So I've only been out for about two years. Um, so I still very much feel like a new grad and um, every week I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing. But um, I'm always encouraged when I look back at where I was two years ago, I'm like, oh, okay, I do know things. <laughs> um, and so I love getting to do stuff like this. I, I love the, um, just the opportunity to work with students. So thanks for having me on. Dope. Sweet. Okay. Well, you've got full reign with how you want to run this paper and run today. So it's completely cool. up to you. Um, so yeah, this is like a, obviously a really a short paper. So, um, which I think is sometimes nice not to be overloaded with just a lot of words. And sometimes you can just, my goal for this is that hopefully we can just pull some like big overarching like principles and kind of takeaways um, that you can consider when you're like on your clinicals and your CIs are asking you, okay, how do you take someone who's injured? How do you get them back to sport? Like practically um, just cause this was something that I felt like I really grew in in my last clinical, um, which was at the clinic that I work at now. Um, but it's still like a work in progress. Like there's still days, um, right? Like athletes that I'm not familiar with their sport. It's just a lot of learning of like, okay, what are the needs of your sport? What are the needs of your position? What does your position mean? How do I speak your language? How do I address all the components of getting you back to performance, right? Because we're not just getting people back to like walking and stare, like we have to get them back to performance. And I think that's a, <clears throat> a part of PT school that is not, um, or at least wasn't addressed at my school just because you, we can't be in school for 10 years to learn all this. And so they have to cut out some of the, the fun stuff. Um, and so kind of my goal for this is maybe to just go through kind of the, the five phases here and maybe just pull from, um, I don't wanna get lost in like all the details necessarily, all the, the numbers and um, those kinds of things, maybe just some overarching themes. Um, did y'all get a chance to look at any of the videos that were like supplementary? If not, I was going to share my screen and just we could maybe watch a few of them. Just for, I think it's helpful to kind of see what they're talking about um, and just kind of see the progression of here's what, you know, a controlled condition looks like. Here's what it looks like as we're getting back to sport. Um, so um, we'll jump right in. Um, so basically the intro just kind of goes into uh, kind of setting up the paper. Um, I think biggest thing is that like at the end of the intro in that last paragraph, it talks about um, just progressively incorporating perceptual and reactive neurocognitive challenges, which is something that, again, I don't think was hit on in school. Um, I think that just takes a lot of like effort on the, the PT's part to consider those things to be like a thorough clinician. Um, like it's easy to, to look at someone and be like, okay, you can squat and you can run, like go back to sport. And there's clinics that still do that. Um, but I think you, um, you'd benefit greatly and you would benefit your athlete greatly by considering, okay, how can I actually mimic the needs of the game, right? Because when you're in a, in a game, in a sport, you're having to like, there's so much going on. You're not having to think about how you're jumping and landing and what your knees. You went in, it's like, you shouldn't have to focus things this should have got taken care of way early um and you don't want your athlete going back to sport thinking about um what their knees doing or what their arms doing or if they're in the right position like they have to focus on who's coming at me how can i react like decision making all those kind of higher level cognitive things um so i do like that this paper kind of addresses so going into the first part um control can control chaos continuum um, so they basically took a GPS and followed a central defender um, with a hamstring injury. Matter. They basically looked at, okay, what pre-injury level, what was their overall training load during the week? Uh, that's kind of the baseline. So once this person gets injured, that's kind of the baseline that you're trying to get people back to, um, at least in this um, this example, which is going to be true no matter the athlete, whether it's a pitcher, right? You're looking at, okay, 
how many pitches are you throwing um, before injury? Okay, now we have to get you back to that. And so you're always having to look at pre-injury, what's the volume of, of work being done? What's the intensity of work being done? What types of movements are being done? And how do we get you back to doing that? And I think that can be a little bit like overwhelming. Like it was overwhelming for me and it still can be if I don't know exactly the sport of just like, man, well, how do I, how do I get you back? Um, so this is just a reminder, keep it really simple. Just watch what they have to do, like go on YouTube or just ask them, Hey, what is the most important thing that you have to do from a positional standpoint or like a technical standpoint? And they'll tell you like, Oh, I have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and if you don't know what that means, just ask them, Hey, will you show me or will you show me videos of what that means? Um, so let the athlete like teach you don't be too prideful or like scared to admit to them that you don't know you don't know how to like speak the language of MMA if you're treating a like a wrestler or something um, or not a wrestler a mixed martial arts that involves right wrestling and striking and all those components. Shelby um, before you continue do you want to for people who may not know can you give like a little description of what GPS is and what why is that helpful? Yeah. So it's essentially a, you know, piece of technology that you can put on a person, right? So most like pro teams, like I was at CSM um, a few months ago and they have it so good because all of the players on these pro teams all have GPS. So they all have these like um, pieces of technology that track their acceleration, their speed, their distance, just all these variables. And then that can get dumped, you know, into a computer system and you can track, you can just see, okay, this person here was their like overall like workload and that workload can be defined by a lot of different things. But if you're just looking at total distance covered, right, you can see like, okay, player A covered this amount of distance this week in this game. And then in this game, they covered this amount. And so you can kind of track like spikes or valleys in training load. Um, so that's kind of essentially what it is. It's just a, an objective way to, to get data on any variable but most commonly probably like running distance, um, changes in speed, that kind of thing. Um, so was that helpful? Okay, cool. Um, so like I said, their example is the central defender with a hamstring injury. So I just kind of want to stop there. Um, eval day one, you're listening to what position do you play? If you don't know the position, um, it's would probably be helpful to just ask about, Hey, what are the needs of your position? What do you have to get back to doing? Um, so I'm not a, I don't have a soccer background. So like I had to go look up, I'm like, what does a central defender do? <laughs> like I know offense versus defense generally, um, you know, and so um, understanding positional needs. And so just things that, that kind of came up on my own, like research, um, like anticipation, right. Being able to like close in on an opponent. Um, so that's like a, a good kind of takeaway offense versus defense is offense is always trying to evade someone where defense is trying to close in on someone. Um, and that's just, that's a dichotomy, but it's a helpful just kind of separation, at least for me personally. Um, they're generally a good passer, and then um, they're also um, having to head balls. So if there's any like soccer pros in here, feel free to chime in and add to that or correct me if I'm, if I'm off. But um, for me, that's helpful going forward of like, okay, this is what they have to get back to. Other thing you have to look at is, okay, it's a hamstring injury. So things that I consider is like from a tissue standpoint, what tissue is injured, and then how did it get injured? And then what is going to load that tissue that might be a risk for re-injury in the future, All right? So most commonly hamstring injury, especially in soccer is going to be a sprinting type injury. Um, so understanding, hey, yeah, what's up? Can I chime in on that relative to position? Go so for in, it. in soccer, something that's really interesting to consider and really sports in general is it takes a solid 20 yards or so to get to tops position it's always helpful to ask the question when this person accelerates do they ever leave acceleration and mm -hmm. so for a central defender that's probably pretty rare yeah uh, because the distance they travel is so short so especially with a hamstring injury I would be really curious like whether it was a plan you know you can dive into the mechanism right but top end speed is probably something they're not exposed to as much but maybe in practice, there's a high demand for that. These coaches can be really dumb and make people run hundreds or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so I think always like asking that question too, like does this person ever even get to top speed in their position can be really helpful. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm making my own notes on that. Um, 
Um, so yes, that's helpful, right? So knowing um, short bursts versus like longer distance, um, and then that can lead you into a whole like another rabbit hole of what stresses what during like acceleration versus top end speed. Um, and Derek Hansen has a lot of good resources on kind of breaking down um, some of that. And he has some interesting thoughts on like hamstring rehab with like, whenever he's rehabbing hamstring, he like starts with short accelerations because of uh, the point that Taylor made that you're not stressing the hamstrings the same way that you are at um, top or top top speed. Um, so um, we'll kind of get into the actual continuum. So high control, um, this is going to be just trying to like accumulate submaximal running running volume um, for this person. So there's, you know, different ways that you can calculate submaximal speed. Um, just to like give an example, if you kind of know their 40 yard um, dash time, you can just do some multiplication. And um, I know there's a few different ways to do this. So if Taylor or Chris, um, you'll have any different ways, feel free to shout out. Um, <clears throat> but for example, if they run their 40 in like a five second um, time, just as an example, and you're wanting them to run at like 60% speed, you could take that five seconds, multiply by 1.4, that would give you like a seven second time. So you're essentially just constraining the task saying, okay, you need to cover this distance, but you have to do it in this amount of time. Um, and so you can have them work into submaximal running speed. That way, um, there's not a lot of like change of direction in this um, phase for the purpose of just keeping things um, controlled, right? So not adding in multi-planar movements just yet, just keeping everything sagittal plane. Um, as far as like energy system development, um, you're probably gonna be looking at more like aerobic, more so than like anaerobic. So more extensive versus intensive, which we'll get into here in a little bit as well. Um, so as far as their like work to rest ratios, um, I think in the chart it goes into like they're having them do like three to four minutes of sub max running and then like a minute or two of rest. Um, so high control is pretty straightforward. You're just trying to accumulate volume here um, and getting them comfortable. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. And Shelby, I actually had a question like so. um, when it's first introducing like control chaos, like continuum, um, I really like the point it makes that it's based like progression to the next phase is like based off of the athletes like abilities um, rather than like a period of time post injury or whatever that is that really makes sense to me like if they've sat around for six weeks it's not like they're now in a new phase it's mm -hmm. it's what they're able to do um, and so I a question that like kept coming up for me when going from different phases was like, how are we, I don't know, I guess like what are the like cutoff, like what's the passing ability to then progress, you know? Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, so it depends on like the research you're looking at. I would say most generally most um, papers are going to, it's going to be more objective based. So looking at, okay, do they have 80% strength um, symmetry? Do they have pain like three out of 10 or less with like isometric holds, um, with like isometric like knee flexion hold? Um, can they jog without pain, right? And then at that point you're like, okay, then let's move into the next phase. So it's going to be like criterion based, right? Not just like time, like, okay, it's been a week at this level, we're gonna go to the next one. So generally <clears throat> you're thinking about pain. Is it minimal to none? Um, what does their strength look like? Um, can they tolerate submaximal intensities of the thing you're trying to get them back to doing maximally? So can they tolerate jogging before sprinting? Um, do you have anything okay, to add? So, so, yeah. So uh, just another thing on that. So then say you're in a phase and all of a sudden, all of a sudden like symptoms are coming back. Does that mean um, like you would try to maintain at that? I, I guess it's tough, like with something like this to not like get into the weeds. I was just trying to like put together like a mind patient for me. Yeah. Um, if I may be able to step in a little bit as well. Sorry, Taylor, were you going to say something? Yeah, but go ahead, Alec. I, I was just going to say hello, by the way, actually. I don't think we've ever actually met in person before. I know I've like seen you on 
uh, Instagram and stuff, but nice to meet you, Taylor. Um, I think if you kind of look at like everything along the continuum, um, I don't know. I, I, I try to like relate stuff to ACL rehab a lot because I think that's pretty like well known for most people. Um, and so like looking at along the continuum, this might not even be until maybe three or four months out from, uh, from the beginning of rehab. So like, there's probably like Shelby was saying, a lot of prerequisites you've met before you're kind of getting into this sort of stuff, like a lot of strength prerequisites, um, and like building up a workload to be able to tolerate this sort of activity in the first place. Does that kind of help Kevin? Yeah. Yeah. That definitely does help. Um, Kevin, kind of, what, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was, I was just going to say that like, then if we're far enough out, then it's less of like a tissue injury damage. It's like, we're now past like that phase of like acute healing. And now we're into trying to increase their capacity. So we're less worried about like the injury and, and more looking towards like something like that is that I think it depends you know like if you think about an ACL graft like that thing's remodeling for so long um I think what's really helpful is if you look at University of Delaware's return to running protocol has soreness rules and so they have um levels for return to running that's you know it's like run walk intervals and then they have a pdf online but their soreness rules are really helpful because they're like if you have soreness with a warm-up do this if you have your symptoms during, do this. If it's after, um, and they, they kind of give suggestions for like dropping down versus resting versus continuing at the same level. Um, and I think that's a good heuristic overall, what, whether you're using their return to running or a different one. The other thing I would add too, is if you're doing something with um, hamstring, with like a muscle strain, you probably have that objective test that you're doing, you know, along the way, right? Like what's that thing? You know, a super easy example is, lateral epicondylitis because you know it's like that picking up the coffee cup but for your hamstring patient maybe it's like how far are they getting in their single leg RDL and that's just their benchmark of normal for them at that stage as so you could use that as your test along the way uh, you know it depends what the patient their injury is but I think having that objective like check box of monitoring symptom response or even something like joint circumference so a lot of times like late stage ACL meniscus, people will start getting a lot, getting swelling. Well, if you're like monitoring joint line circumference, then you'll catch that pretty quickly and can drop the volume. You know, maybe you maintain intensity and cut the volume in half and monitor response, that sort of thing. So you could, I think as long as you have these heuristics built in, um, you're going to be well, well prepared to deal with it knowing that like we're dealing with humans and weird stuff happens that we don't always understand. Right. Cool. Yeah. That's super helpful. I guess, I don't know. It was just hard coming from like starting second year PT school to be like, what does any of this mean? You know, but based on the injury and then what part of the body, like what's going on um, and just developing like, that contextual knowledge for what they're dealing with. That's and that the work that Shelby is, you know, walking us through here is something you could take a different task and apply a similar framework, right? And so I think knowing those things like, yeah, what's their kind of that thing that pisses them off, right? Um, that we can keep tabs on that's pretty objective. Yeah. And there's not a right or wrong formula for adjusting the workload either, right? Like, yeah. you're doing too much. You know, Shelby might cut it by 35% and I might cut it by 25 or 50, you know, depending on the day and how much coffee I've had and the person in front of me um, and their history. And we're probably not, any of us are right. No, or yeah. Or wrong either. <laughs> we probably have good reasons. Exactly. Yeah. As long as you have like a a good reason for doing what you're doing and like some good um just a good framework to pull from a good just kind of these are my general rules for things and then i'm I have some wiggle room within those rules because it's just like taylor said we're dealing with humans and it's not always going to make sense and it's not always going to be like a one-to-one -one, um was someone trying to say something maybe not okay um 
So any other questions on that before we move to, to moderate um, control? Um, so moderate control, this is where you're going to start to introduce um, change of direction um, with the ball, at least in this uh, particular athlete. Um, so the, the cool thing about this that I think is helpful to, to understand is that you're introducing change of direction. So you're introducing um, more degrees of freedom, so less, um, less constraints, but it's still predictable. So you're not having any reactive component yet. Um, so you're still increasing chaos a little bit, but it's still pretty controlled because the athlete knows where they're going, what they're doing. Um, there's not any dis there's not any like big decision making having having to go on here. Um, I had one question real quick, Shelby. Yeah. Sorry, before we move on to the uh, the second one about the uh, the first one, um, I know it's mostly we kind of talked mostly about like sagittal plane stuff, but do you introduce a lot of like frontal plane stuff in that first phase as well? like you know side shuffling karaoke yeah, yeah no i would um and that's something that uh, i don't remember how long ago this was but i think initially i just for various reasons was like sagittal plane first then frontal then transverse yeah the paper that i was reading on hamstring injuries a few months ago that was arguing to introduce frontal plane transverse plane and then sagittal plane last um for that reason and so yeah personally i i kind of we'll just introduce all depending on um tolerance yeah. um, if they're like really lit up and like can't handle any like sagittal plane um like hip hinge variations then yeah i'll go more like lateral lunges or lateral transverse stuff and then try to reintegrate sagittal plane things as they can so something john hodges talk at nevada pt talks about that's super helpful is framing things in terms of what's their high tolerance movements versus low tolerance movements. And I think like what Shelby's talking about fits into that really well here, you know, a low tolerance movement for hamstrings is probably going to be their hinging, bridging, that sort of thing, depending how early stage they are. But that frontal plane, like lateral banded walks, side planks, that sort of thing is probably going to be a lot more tolerable. And that's a way to get like maintain a little bit higher volume and intensity in their training. Mm -hmm. have high tolerance movements. Yeah. Exactly. No, I like that. Um, good question, Alec. Um, so yeah, change of change of direction. Um, other thing that I would kind of take away here is that it's gonna be more of like an individual drill. You're not reacting to like it's not any kind of like one v one type situation. Um, they're also going to introduce like short little burst accelerations, um, which again is increasing the intensity a little bit. Um, but again, you're not having to react to anything necessarily. Um, so I did want to, I want to try to share my screen to show you all the video because I found it helpful, but I don't know if it's going to let me, I've never done this before. So let's see, did that work? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, I think it was, it was, it was, it was, it was. Can y'all hear me? Okay, Zoom's giving me all kinds of warnings. Don't forget your walking period in between. Remember, we're looking for a subtle change of speed and tempo. Did y'all hear the audio on that? Okay, so I kind of, I liked just seeing that because it's helpful to see, okay, there's some change of direction. That's with the ball. It's all predictable. Uh, yeah, still the accent, Gabe. <laughs> um, but then the coach or PT or whoever was working with him, you know, cued him like, don't forget to walk. That way you're starting to 
introduce just some short little bursts. So you're just going from walking back into like a sub max running speed. Um, so that's just like a real easy way, right, to introduce some little accelerations. Um, any thoughts on that or questions on the video? Cool, wonderful. Um, other thing I was gonna mention, I think it was on the table. There's like a lot of tables going on and it's like a very tiny on the paper that I printed out. But yeah, so on that table under the moderate control, the description, it like mentions the fart look running. So I just wanted to say if anyone didn't know what that was, cause I had learned about it, forgot what it was, had to look it up again. Uh, but essentially just alternating running speeds. So going at like a like pretty moderate pace to a little bit more um, intense pace. If you're using RPE, um, like a four to six, and then to like a seven to nine, so just some alternating intensities. Um, so, any questions on on that in particular? Um, pretty straightforward, I think. So the next one is going control to chaos, and so that's when we're going to start to get into that intensive versus extensive um, training. You're also going to get the weekly structure that's going to mimic like typical training structure. So, right, questions for your athletes asking, okay, how many times a week are you practicing? How many hours are you practicing? Um, and then that's just kind of your goal as you're getting them back into things and then educating them that if you're coming to see me once or twice a week, that's two hours during the whole week. And if you're trying to get back to like 10 hours of practice in the week, like where are you going to make up those eight hours? Like I can't do that. And so just laying out the numbers for them is helpful, I think, to see like, you can't just come to rehab twice a week and be good to go for practice. Like you're going to have to put in work outside of here. Um, Shelby, for athletes who aren't, obviously most of the patients we, as this Zoom call will we'll work with probably aren't gonna be using GPS. How, do you educate about tracking their return to practice or tracking minutes or anything like that? Um, I would say I don't necessarily educate on tracking as much as like doing. I probably should like, encourage some kind of like formal tracking system but um i haven't yet it's more so like you know if you're in practice like for my basketball players like for every you know for every 10 reps of of this activity that your teammates are doing i only want you doing five and so giving them some kind of you know 50 percent if you're going into like a scrimmage like for every like 10 minutes that your teammates are playing i only want you playing five um so not really like a formal tracking but just giving them some kind of something to anchor anchor on to um yeah yeah, what about yeah. you? I've had high school kids where I'll like write down for them and Hodges is really great at this too. If you guys don't know who John Hodges is, he was one of my CIs and he's baller, also super fun to, to party with. Um, but <laughs> he's really, really smart and really, really great at like the practical side of patient care and is like a walking pub med. And so he'll like track out for people like, okay, here's your, he'll write on a piece of paper, like you know, Monday through Friday, here are your practices. This is what you're gonna do in each practice. Um, and then just like have them take a picture of it on their phone. Um, so like that can be helpful and then have them report back and or have them write down like, oh yeah, I did like 75% of practice or 25% of the non-contact stuff, which was about this roughly this many minutes. So, yeah, I've also definitely done stuff with kids of like, okay, in scrimmage, you get five minutes on, five minutes off, you know? Yeah. Do you also have them track any kind of like, um, like, RPE or just like immediate like response to those things so that you know when you see them a week later they're not like I don't remember how I felt <laughs> uh depends on the person okay um because I think some if there's somebody that's like I feel like with girls a lot of times they're hyper focused on how they feel For sure. I don't care how you feel I just want you to do um sure. times with boys I tend to give them a cap I don't want anything nothing harder than a seven out of ten if that means you have to sit you sit yeah <laughs> nice I like that. Um. Taylor, I have a question based off that. Yeah. So I've never prescribed RPEs for like anything besides resistance training. So how accurate do you feel like a seven out of 10 is for an individual? Like what does that inherently mean to you? I think if you're trained, you know what that is. Um, like I remember even in like my low level high school soccer coaches being like, all right, this is like 25% speed, 50% speed, 75% speed. Um, I think you could even in clinic, like do some jogging and be like, Hey, like, does this feel like about like, find what feels like about 50%. Um, 
or even if you go like low, medium, hard, and I want you to stay at medium, you know? Um, but I think it can be for any intensity. Like I've even seen it used for say like climbing athletes, like rock climbing, mm-hmm. nothing out of 10 RPE, like mm-hmm. working again. Mm-hmm. Um, or most of your sessions are in the six to seven range and then you, know, you do short bouts of harder stuff. Mm-hmm. But I, I think a lot of people can intuit that. I mean, I would encourage any of you who have a habit of running, like go play with that. Like just go out and find what feels like, you know, 25, 50, 75. And that can be really helpful to kind of feel it yourself. And percent yeah. and effort are not the same, mm-hmm. right? So that, <laughs> that's some wiggle room there, but there's wiggle room in all of it, right? So does it matter? Probably not. Yeah, I think you can get, um, yeah, there's like a lot of different rabbit holes you can go down on like the whole, yeah, RP effort um, percentage is like, it's all, um, it's all a little bit different, but I think, yeah, if you can keep it simple of like, okay, this is like super easy, this is medium, this is really hard, (laughs) and just trying to bucket, um, or even just like Scott Morrison's really good about anchoring patients in the clinic of just like, this is what a 10 out of 10 feels like. Yeah. You know, um, and that's more like on the strength training side, but I think you could do that with like a, like a med ball circuit. Like you're going to go as hard as you can for 10 seconds. That's what a 10 out of 10 is. Um, I want you at a seven out of 10. (laughs) Yeah. And I think too, um, that there is for those of you who maybe aren't headed to sports medicine or will inevitably have rotations where you're working with very, very sedentary people or really deconditioned people, these things still apply, right? So this control and chaos could be as simple as somebody who wants to get back to gardening and yard work and, you know, doing floor transfers from half kneeling to standing is the controlled version, right? And then them doing it, you know, on a, in the practicing, doing that in the grass before they do a full morning of gardening, like would be a progression towards their return to sport, if you will. And the anchoring can be as, as um, simple as, you know, letting that elderly person fail at trying to do a sit to stand without their hands and feel like what it struggles. And then like educating them, like, no, this is good. You know how hard you can try now. We know you could try really hard, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think you can apply these principles in any setting. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I was going to bring that up at the end of the paper, uh, Taylor, but yeah, for the people who aren't like sports minded and they may not inherently like get a ton out of this paper, I think it's just a huge talking point of like this paper does a great job of laying out like you have the demands of the task in the sport and these are the things we have to do to get back to it. And GPS is phenomenal because GPS actually shows you like here's the volume of your typical time in a professional soccer match, a football match. And it's like you're here, this is your intensity, this is your volume. We inherently have to make these steps to get you back. But like those principles, as you said, Taylor, it's like that can be applied in any setting. Um, and you should like it, look at it as like, this is the task or this is the behavior we want you to get back to. If you're off in like La La Land, just like giving everyone a massage and then release them, it's like you have no clue if they prepared themselves and their tissues and their confidence back to like whatever it is, no matter kind of where the spectrum is from like elite level athletics to like as you said, gardening. Mm-hmm. Um, two points to that as well. One, and Shelby, that you probably have some insight on this too. When I was at Healthy Baller, the, one of the owners there, Matt Boyd, is a, works with a college lacrosse team, and they use GPS. And he was saying that after every game, he looks at the data and gives the coach a breakdown of players, red, yellow, green. Mm-hmm. Um, So like the players who are on the bench get a green score, which means the day after the game, they're doing heavy conditioning. Mm -hmm. Players who did a lot, you know, who's maybe a starter who played the whole match, they do nothing. Or they're like doing like active mobility, whatever. Um, I think that can be maybe a little bit of an awkward discussion with some patients of like, okay, so before you got hurt, how many minutes were you playing? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's really important too, to know like, okay, maybe that person is ready to return to sport sooner than the person or not as soon. You you could argue either way, but just keeping that in mind of like, or, you know, they are returning, but maybe they're still checking in with you as a PT. How many minutes did you play? Oh, I played seven minutes. 
okay, we can go pretty hard. We need to go hard today versus, oh my gosh, like you played 75% of the match. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? <laughs> what, well, and at that point, you're really training that athlete to the athlete that is sitting on the bench. You're training them to get back to practice <laughs> rather, right. than perform, like, rather than performing in a game. Yeah. Um, that's like, that's a good point. Based off that, do you want to either Shelby or Taylor, do you all want to distinguish like kind of your thoughts of return to practice, return to play, return to sport, kind of those delineations? Because I think there's like a lot of people say return to sport, but that's kind of like the end goal yeah. or a return to competition. But there's a lot of like other things that could be prior to that. Yeah, I think um, at least what's most recently has been kind of on my mind when it comes to return to practice versus return 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 to uh play or return to sport return to competition i'll say um like i was wrestling with like i don't want to gas my athletes if they had like a really really hard workout day yesterday because i would like them to recover um on the other hand like coaches most high school coaches don't really care about that kind of stuff so they're just going to gas them every day and so on one hand like i am having to prepare them for practice from the standpoint of you're not going to get adequate rest intervals the way that I would like you to um, because your coach does not like prescribe that. Um, so you have to do hard things for two hours um, versus like, okay, me trying to prepare you for a game is like, I'm going to give you a lot of like adequate rest so that you are getting back to performance. And so um, I don't really have like a clear answer on that necessarily as much as when I just think about returning to practice, it's more like you just got to do a lot of hard things for a long period of time because you're not going to get rested versus returning to performance. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more particular about um, we're going to do like this really hard interval. You're going to get a lot of rest and then we're going to do it again so that you're training the actual, if you're trying to train like sprint speed, like I'm going to have you sprint and then I'm going to have you rest a long time so that you can actually recover versus I'm going to have you do repeated sprints like you would in practice just for the sake of being able to do gassers for however long. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a really important conversation to have with the coach. Like, I've definitely worked with athletes who were making great progress, maybe even were starting to play again in a limited sense, and then they lost the game, and the coach made them run 300-yard shuttles as punishment, mm -hmm. and the kid, you know, pop, goes the hammy. Um, <laughs> good happened <laughs> like why was this kid running punishment reps and then at the you know the ATC was like I didn't clear him to do that and the PT's like I didn't clear him to do it and everybody's like no I didn't clear him I didn't well he's a 16 17 year old kid his coach tells him to run he's gonna run like and so I think having those really clear conversations and even like getting to know high school coaches in your area or at least opening it up to them of like hey I would love to dialogue with you sending a note can be really helpful of like we are doing conditioning in clinic um they're not doing anything extra they're allowed this many minutes and that's it um so like just again feeling things out and also having caught knowing your athlete right like the soft skills of will they say no i'm not supposed to run and yeah. will they be able to advocate for themselves or are they going to struggle with that and maybe need you to be their advocate mm -hmm. or parents can be a huge issue with that too and parents can sometimes be not bought into this idea that max output requires max rest or <laughs> close to max rest and that can be and even you know again the application to old people right you want them to perform a max a near max effort to stand they're not like that they, they can't do five in a row so like that's the conversation right postpartum women right returning to running or whatever the case may be like the the principle is true regardless mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Taylor, to the point of kind of high school or non-professional or collegiate settings, like you can only control so much as a PT. And you see that with this paper, it's like, okay, this is kind of the idealistic model of return to sport, return to play, because you have all of these like constraints in a good way of like, okay, you have this unlimited time with these athletes they really are only focused on their sport. They have like all of the help of the coaches, the strength and conditioning staff, the PTs, the sports scientists. And it's like, that's a phenomenal. And you, and also like European football is very progressive and their kind of interactions between strength and conditioning staff and rehab and coaches. And even if you look at like American football, 
like you still see a lot of crazy shit going on where it's like they do like what you said taylor they'll do conditioning after practice and like things that are so um just almost like beating them down or like mental toughness but it's not really contributing to the like positive adaptations and it may like you may have a negative kind of repercussions from that but going pulling back to like high school or middle school if you're a physical therapist and you're helping a um uh an athlete it's like that it is it gets more like complex because you don't know what's going to happen during their practices or their games or what's going on in like the rest of their life so this editorial is like this is phenomenal if like this is like a dream world but i think the majority of like people even if you're in a sports setting you'd work with like middle school high school maybe college athletes and they don't have this kind of inner collaboration like really positive like collaborative progressive mindset like uh, european professional football and i will say even if you're at high levels in u.s sports it often falls apart pretty <laughs> damn quickly. like i had a, a d1 baseball player i was working with on campus and <clears throat> he would come in absolutely crushed from his session with the strength coaches come to find out the head athletic trainer will not lift at this 25 pound weight restriction so what are the strength coaches doing they're doing their job and they're just crushing him with volume and tempo work this is max restriction is 25 pounds they have no idea that he's been front squatting 225 in clinic like it's like, what? And so then I'm having to go to the head athletic trainer and being like, why won't you lift it? And him being like, okay, I'll raise it to 50. And I'm like, no, <laughs> just get rid of it. Like, <laughs> no, like, and so I finally, I went to the head strength coach. I was like, this guy. Like, I know. <laughs> so it's just like, there's this wherever you end up in like stupid stuff you see at Exos or wherever, like shit's going to happen. And then you're just, we're all managing variability, right? Yeah. I think it's almost harder sometimes at higher levels because there is so many people on, like there's just a bigger team of people where like in high school, it's like, okay, I just need to worry about you, your coach and the trainer, the athletic trainer. And the parent. <laughs> and the, yeah. And the parent. Yeah. I guess in high level sports, the parent's not an issue. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Um, but yeah, Chris, I think, I mean, at least with a lot of my high school kids, um, when we do like return to sports stuff, we try to keep it as simple as we can. And it's not perfect by any means, but it's a lot of like, okay, you can go do warm up and cool down when your team's doing practice, you get to do your rehab. Okay. And then maybe, a, you know, whenever it's time to move them on, then it's like, okay, now you can do like individual drills. Um, okay. Now you can do one V one. Okay. Now you can do like small sided scrimmages okay, now full practice, okay, now, you know, a part of a game and then a full game. So trying to at least give them some specific instructions without getting too hung up on, like, specific, like, workload um, tracking because it's just hard um, with high school kids sometimes. I think a pro tip there as well can be knowing sport and knowing what the breaks are. So, like, with soccer, with an athlete, you can play the last 15 minutes of each half, right? Because yeah. So there's an end point if you tell them you can play 15 minutes and coach starts them and it's a tie game and it's you know x y and z other factors do you think mm -hmm. they're gonna come after 15 minutes no <laughs> you can play the last 15 minutes yeah, or in basketball right like you can play this many minutes a quarter mm -hmm. kind of um nuance it that way a little bit i like that i like that um, I'm going to share my screen again just to watch some of the videos for the <clears throat> control to chaos. Um, so as far as the intensive versus extensive, so intensive, um, think more, um, obviously like higher intensity, like short bursts, um, not as long of rest breaks, a little bit more like reaction based and then extensive. Um, they kind of talk about more like aerobic power intervals. Um, so running or some kind of conditioning from an aerobic standpoint. Um, so longer durations, shorter rest breaks. Um, and I'm sorry, I think I misspoke. On the intensive, um, you're having longer rest breaks because of the intensive um, aspect. So higher intensity, longer rest breaks, extensive, lower intensity, um, shorter rest breaks because you don't need it as much. So let me pull up the 
videos that go with that. Four and five. So this is the one that they quoted for the intensive. Um, nope, I lied, video three. Intensive work. So we don't have to watch all that, but you can kind of get the idea. There's a little bit more change of direction, a little bit more reaction to the um, person passing the ball. Um, and then video four, Let's see. Just four. too many videos. Hang on. Video four. Julian. So similar thing there, um, as far as intensive, right? The area that he's working in is restricted. So it's not a huge area, it's a smaller space, um, but he's still having to react to the ball, um, accelerate, decelerate. Um, and then when it comes to extensive, So this isn't the most exciting video just because it's someone running, but um, this is just from a, what it looks like to do extensive work versus intensive. Uh, more space, he's pretty much just running basically like a 15 second run, 15 seconds to rest, uh, multiple intervals. And we're not gonna watch all minute and a half of this, but because y'all are smart people. <laughs> It's basically this for the next minute and a half. Um, so he runs down and back. Um, someone's timing him just to keep him on track, and then he's resting for 15 seconds. So one to one there. Um, and you know, work to rest ratios. Uh, you can kind of manipulate that a bunch of different ways. Um, Shelby, could you make the differentiation between what extensive is and intensive is one more time? Yeah. So I would say generally, extensive is going to be more lower intensity longer duration, shorter rest break, where intensive is gonna be higher intensity, um, um, excuse me, longer rest break. Um, and then generally just like intensive is gonna be more intensity, more um, acceleration, deceleration, where extensive is just gonna be more kind of like tempo runs um, in a linear fashion. Yeah, maybe to add on that, and I'm curious to hear if Shelby or Taylor's like, the original place I heard like that kind of extensive versus intensive tempo is like through Charlie Francis, the like running method. Um, but the way I describe it or the way I think of it is like those intensive sessions, it's like those are almost like creating specific, like what Shelby said, but like specific demands that are more uh, like I guess require more of an actual like demand. Whereas the low extensive sessions are in a sense, like they're almost like active recovery. Like they're not really stressing the system that much. And so it's almost like high and low sessions where you never really have like a medium, like you can think of it as like glycolytic or something where you're just kind of like, you're not going fast enough or intense enough to create like a sport specific adaptation and you're not going low enough to actually recover from it. And sometimes that needed that's needed when you have like a middle ground sport, like 800 meter running or like MMA or something where you are kind of living in the gray um, or like CrossFit. But some of these sports like soccer, American football, rugby, it's a very like a lactic aerobic where you have these short sprints and you have these really long periods of like walking, slow jogging, standing. So the extensive versus intensive does a great job of preparing both of those aspects and not really giving you this like, shitty middle ground where you're not really doing well of either side if that helps yeah the middle ground is going to feel like a lot of hard work with not a lot of adaptation <laughs> so and that's like basically preseason for any high school sport right 
And uh, that's actually something I think that is really worth having a conversation with your patient about. Um, and this is not original to me. This is stuff I've learned from Ryan Bogus, who works with a handful of NFL players. And so when he preps them for their training camp, they do one session a week that's like glycolytic misery um, yeah. to, just to keep them prepped for it. Um, mm -hmm. And then actually will coach the guys like, swing your arms a little faster than you need to. So it looks like you're running faster in these stupid drills that have nothing to do with your position. Um, and like high school kids, obviously that's like kind of a weird, like you don't want to encourage slacking, um, but also just, you know, maybe even the education piece of like, hey, the stuff you're doing in training camp isn't super specific to your sport. Yeah. Uh, but like, you know, it's just how it is. You have to go in and work hard. So it's going to suck, but we've prepared you. And having a big aerobic base will help with that, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that's something too, I think like can be hard to, is overlooked, right? Because them doing steady state for 30 minutes is not something we're going to bill for, but it's yeah. definitely I think it's good to give the option, hey, if you want to stay longer and do that on your own, we're not going to charge you for that. Mm -hmm. I think it would be really helpful and get the parent on board with longer PT sessions for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think educating, right, because sometimes kids, they're just like, I don't want to be on a bike for 30 minutes. And just educating, well, you don't have to be on a bike for 30 minutes. You could go, you could do like an ab circuit or like a low intensity like med ball work or like some sled work at like low intensities, as long as you're going for like a long duration and keeping the intensity low, you're still getting similar adaptations. Um, and so, cause I think that is like a common, a common thing is like, well, I don't want to go run for 30 minutes unless, unless they're a soccer player, then they love running. Um, <laughs> well, and, and so, you yeah. they kind of showed it with some of those earlier, um, the high control and moderate control of like, you could have those sessions where like you're using, you're kicking the ball and you're like slowly running and passing it or hitting it. And it's like, if you do that continually for 20 or 30 minutes, like that's achieving kind of the same adaptation. Exactly. And it may be more interesting than just like jogging in place or running for whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, now we're coming up on an hour. So we'll kind of go through the next two fairly quickly and then wrap up um, just to be mindful of y'all's of y'all's time. Um, so moderate chaos, um, you're basically having higher speed running with some um, unpredictable movements. You're trying to increase overall like sprint distance. So not necessarily like the distance of like a single sprint, but like the volume of sprint, the volume of sprinting distance wise. Um, and then just trying to get their typical training um, load up to, um, to normal at this point. Um, so video wise, I'm gonna pull up just to see, just so y'all can see it. Um, it's on video seven and then high chaos I'll just go ahead and say this now it's just uh, testing worst case scenarios and I think as a, a new clinician that can be a little bit scary to just be like I'm gonna test the worst case scenario in clinic uh, right because, but you have to because sport is the worst case scenario for these kids and so if you are scared they're going to be scared um, I just had a kid this week who was doing double leg. He's 10 months out of ACL because he's 12 and was really behind. He was doing double leg, like little pogo hops and just tour, like retouring clinic, doing literally something very conservative. Um, so I say that not to, to say that you shouldn't do that, but to say you can, you can be smart and do everything the way that you're supposed to and even do like scary things and kids are going to be just fine, but there will be instances where, where things happen. Um, even if they're objectively ready to do those things. And so um, don't be afraid to do, to do hard things and, and scary things with those kids um, when they're ready for it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pull up the last few videos. So video seven, I believe is the like higher speed running with some change of direction work. And again, we're not gonna watch all four minutes of this. So those players having to 
field passes and then have to to go chase chase the ball downfield, um, which is going to basically force her to run faster. So you can actually use how hard you're kicking, right, to force the patient to pick up speed. Um, so they're probably not having to tell this person to run fast. They're just kicking the ball really far and having her track it down. Her or him, I can't tell. That is one of the videos. And then I think. So much of the same there, um, some acceleration, deceleration, change of direction, reaction. <clears throat> so hopefully this just kind of gives you some, some general rules to follow as far as like, okay, how can I start in a more controlled setting and move to chaos? Because that's the rules that you're going to follow for any athlete, any sport. Um, and it's helpful to pull from. And like y'all kind of alluded to, like it's, it's not like a straightforward process by any means. There's a lot of, there's a lot of gray and there's a lot of times where it's like, well, how much swelling am I okay with? How much can I push through? How much soreness after we do some of this is like okay to me and to the athlete? Um, and that's fine. That's part of just part of the process and part of um, like clinical reasoning is is learning those things because you can't find it in a paper. You do have to use your brain, <laughs> um, which makes it really fun. Um, it makes it not boring at all and, and then makes you go seek out um, just other clinicians to, to bounce ideas off of and um, not be on an island by yourself. Hey Shelby. What's up? Um, so like I've been in experiences where like the facilities I've been working at as a tech were kind of what we talked about earlier where they wanted that objective like okay you're at the five week mark we can now introduce this and that and I know you were talking about kind of going along like other measures like um, making sure that they were a little more symmetrical in strength and things like that. Do you ever get into instances where it's kind of like at odds with the physician or maybe other PTs that you're working with? Or how are you doing that like in the real world sense? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not like against time-based criteria, like at all means like going back to the ACL example, like there are time frames that you need to respect to not retear the graft <laughs> um, from something that you're doing. Um, it's good. Sometimes things happen. Um, but for example, like I'm probably not going to have someone start running like earlier than three months one because that's just how our surgeons um, have have their protocols, and so I want to respect that um, too from a graft healing standpoint. Um, so that is like one thing that I'll tell patients: like we will not be running until sometime after three months. But you also have to, you know, have this score on this test, have this strength, have you know this ability. Um, so it's both. Um, as far as like at odds with coworkers. Um, I can't think of any specific examples. I mean, we all have, I think we're all pretty good about having like criteria based, um, like clearance for sport. Um, and sometimes I think it's rare to meet that before like the time-based criteria would even happen. Um, I usually feel like it's usually time-based. You can check off first, but then the objective things kind of come after that, at least like anecdotally. Um, yeah, I was asking mainly because, like, granted, you're sorry, um, you're kind of younger, so I could see how like a lot of young PTs can get into situations where it's like they get other clinicians working around them that are maybe a little older and mm -hmm. are purely just in that time frame model. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know if everybody you're working around kind of shared the same philosophies and things like that. Yeah, we're all like 25 to like 33-ish. So we're all similar in age, um, similar in, ex or not similar in experience. There are more experienced clinicians. Um, but just our clinic is fairly progressive as far as like research and sports stuff. So luckily I'm in a clinic where we don't have a bunch of like, um, like old thinkers, so. With this paper, Taylor, Shelby, or any of y'all, is there anything you didn't like about kind of their progression or their thought process? Like one thing for me, and maybe it was just nitpicking, but like the verbiage of like chaos, control to chaos, it just like, it was a weird way to explain it in my head. Like 
obviously it's kind of addressing the same things, but it's, I, I've heard it more of like, you have like these constraints or you're working at like these principles of like intensities or durations and then moving back towards like less prediction and more reaction. Um, but were there any things from the paper that you're like, oh, I don't know if I agree with that or uh, like, yeah. That's a good question. Um, nothing necessarily comes to mind. I really resonate with control and chaos. I like just kind of, to me, it's very synonymous with like having like a closed skill and an open skill, just you're kind of moving on that continuum um, or predictable to unpredictable um, change of direction versus like true agility, right? So having to make a decision based on a stimulus or based on um, some other person. Um, as far as like critiques of the paper or critiques of like the continuum, um, I think the the only thing that, I mean, and I didn't look into this super um, deeply just because I haven't had time to, but just like their work to rest ratios on some of it was interesting. Um, it was just different than what I would have thought it would have been based on their goal. Um, and I think one of those was like on the aerobic like power, like intervals, like the one to one, I think I would have done more um like a, just a longer rest period if we're addressing like aerobic power so it's like real like small things like that but the overall like principle of the continuum i i really liked uh, I, and then, and, I oh. think it's a little to think about how you can introduce that chaos or um, unanticipated or cognitive tasks at a higher level of control, right? And so it's not just a continuum, it's almost like a sliding scale. Yep. And so what you can progress is like, you know, somebody is here on the scale in terms of, you know, in a con really controlled, closed environment, we can actually scale back the, de the physical demand of the task as we scale up kind of that open demands of the task and that is a progression even if physically maybe it's different yeah that's a good point sorry what were you gonna say oh i was just gonna say um that one thing i liked that shelby mentioned earlier was like um sort of using these phases as like to the like specifics of the sport or the patient like sort of giving them examples of like what the progression will be back to like return to performance um like the small scrimmages on the side and stuff like that especially that stuck out to me for um you know even up to like the high school athletes like they might just be practicing but they like giving them something tangible that's like they can relate to and and they know, okay, this is like within like the realm of what I should be doing. And then like, this is where I'm going. Um, I think is like a really good structure to provide them early. Um, just to sort of give them, it's almost like a prognosis thing, but just from like the activity standpoint, not necessarily like, I don't know, just like what their capacity and ability will be like, in the process to getting back out on the field for a game. Well, and that will help them like trust you as the clinician. If you're able to like tell them like, Hey, here's what we're going to start with. Here's where we're going to go to next. Here's where we're going to get to. They're like, Oh, okay. They know what they're doing. It's not just like you, you can only do this right now. And there's no like, but when this happens and you can move on, it's just kind of like, okay, well, how long am I going to be stuck here? Um, so I'm, I'm always pretty um, clear with my like ACL patients of like, for the next year, here's what this is probably going to look like, some variation of this, just so they know, like, here's where we're headed, like, here's where we're at now, um, just so I think that's helpful to not have so many, like, unknowns from, like, the athlete perspective. Yeah, I think that's huge, especially in, like, you think about, like, junior high or high school athletes, like, if, if you're giving them that, it's, like, one, letting them know what to do right now, but then also it's, like, let me try to do this well, because here's the light at the end of the tunnel that I'll I'll be able to get to scrimmaging in, a, in like two months or something or a month. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives them something to look forward to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, hang on, I'm trying to save all these links that y'all are posting in this chat so I can look at this later. 
Because the minute we get out of this, I can't see it, unfortunately, I know it. the hard way and other things. Chris, I think I'm doing Taylor this. just posted that the rehab protocol that every single day at work and I'm like referencing it, like not just for like knee patients, but like other patients I'm seeing too, because it gives a good idea of not just how to like, how to periodize in rehab, but also like how to set up a program on like individual uh, days and like what a session from like week to week should look like and from month to month. Mm -hmm. So if you guys get a chance, highly recommend you like click on that link that Taylor posted and like take a look through that thing. Yeah, also just another plug there is like poke around his website. He has some awesome like pain science handouts for patients that are like one page long infographics um, and can be really helpful to have like a very brief conversation in clinic and be like, hey, take a look at this and like digest it and let me know what you think. Mm -hmm. um, that's been helpful. So many resources. I love it. Research queen. Hey, Chris. Um, well, I'm not going to ask if I can. I'm just going to do it. You guys, like, I'd love to hear from you because I haven't picked the article for next week yet. Um, so two questions. One, do you want something that is more gen pop focused or more athlete focused or one of each? And then the other question is, do you want it to be more of like a summary discussion or do you want me to like prepare questions in advance and make it really interactive? Chime in. I'm not going to chime in because I always chime in. So I'm going to force someone else to. One thing I thought I thought would be cool to discuss within the group is like uh, I, one thing that I don't think that we got a very good grasp on in school at all was like how to break down movement into like different components, you know, and like how to actually say like this is a harder version of this activity. Like this is the goal the patient needs to accomplish that I can progress them to that sort of thing by using this exercise, which is like, this is a simple form of it right now. And then like, this is a way I can make it more challenging, you know, whether that's adding load, increasing range of motion, going from two legs to one leg, like that sort of thing. I feel like we never got that connection made in school. And so that was something that I placed a lot of emphasis on like learning progression within individual movements after I graduated. I think that would be something that would be super helpful for everybody. And that's kind of what I was thinking when you guys said stuff about like uh, strength and conditioning principles, like for this month's kind of uh, topic, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Even the whole conversation of the same um, manipulation of a variable can be a progression or a regression. I think like understanding that, you know, I love the example of box squats, right? Box squats can be a regression for somebody who you're maybe really new to squatting or struggles at a certain depth it can also be a progression and that it allows you to load them way heavier so i think starting to manipulate those areas i would be happy to throw something together on that yeah and then, I, oh sorry you can go oh you're good i was just gonna say i think like based on the way that we were taught stuff in school you kind of get this idea that like when you have a specific condition you need to do this specific exercise to fix it you know and it like took a long time to unlearn that sort of thing and so um i think if we were, we were able to like kind of give that to them prior to them uh like i just i guess just going into it and knowing like there's no single like one best exercise there's no single one best thing you can do for the patient it's like highly dependent on them and like everything can be helpful you just need to figure out like what's the most helpful for them in that specific situation you know mm -hmm. What were you going to say, Gabe? No, um, it doesn't entirely relate, but there's a paper that I've got to look up now. Um, it was from one of the Barbell Medicine Reviews um, looking at, I, yeah, <laughs> um, looking at, I think, like bench press versus like seven different push-up variations, like to where they had it incrementally, incrementally like to increase the um, workload. Um, I got to look for it, um, and once I do, I'll, I'll uh, link it. I think that's the same concept, though, Gabe, of like what you're talking about, Alec. I think, Taylor, a good kind of pathway for next week would be 
exactly how to progress and regress and like where to start and what that looks like. Cause I mean, we had an X phys class and it was a shit show. Like we didn't learn any exercise progression regression. So that may be more of like a, cause that kind of can apply to any population, whether it's gen pop or sports or geriatric or whatever. So I like both those inputs Alex, Alec and Gabe. Do you want like a paper and a slide deck or a slide deck and, or just a paper? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might be easier considering like you might not have one specific paper on that thought process. You could do like a short editorial or like something, if you have something in mind, but if you just want to use like, I'm sure you have tons of like things you've already presented on that are very similar. Like I'm not opposed to that, to doing a week without a paper. Yeah, I have to, if everybody else is okay, I have to make a slide deck on that anyway for something else. So I was like, ooh, <laughs> that would be good to give me a deadline. <laughs> yeah, and a picture says a thousand words, you know, like just getting some of those in there, that'd be, that'd be cool. Cause kind of like what Alec was talking about, and in, even just if it's in one sort of movement pattern, like a progression, then that sort of gives us like a better, um, like concept of where you can like what variables you can change um, and then you know with with that in mind you could probably carry that over and in, into other types of movement as well yeah um, that'd be cool yeah it was like a hard month to figure out because uh, first we started with like clinical or physical activity guidelines, which is this like this huge overarching concept of like no one's physically active, but also there's only so much you can talk about on that because it's one like depressing and two, it's like, yes, we know everyone is like not meeting these guidelines. So we kind of got that out of the way. And I wanted to start with that initially to be like, okay, most of our gen pop, like a lot of these minute details don't matter if they don't even like go for a 10 minute walk. But I think we still need to learn a lot of these principles because we need to have like explanations and reasons for why we're providing this type of load or this type of exercise. So I wanted like Derek, big picture, we just need to move more. And then like Shelby Taylor, and then probably um, Kevin McNamara of like, okay, let's get more down in the weeds and like actually figure some of this more nuanced stuff out. Yeah. And I, I just like shameless plug you guys. I think I drove my clinical instructor crazy in acute care because I literally gave physical activity counseling to probably 85% of the patients I saw. And I was seeing like 16 patients a day plus um, because you do really quick evals. I think she was so sick of hearing it. But you know, it's like, oh, you, you know, how do you make a really boring post stop hip more interesting? Oh, now that you have a new hip. Did you know that the guidelines for older adults are this many minutes a week and you make it really exciting and like you have a new hip now you can do this what are the things that you like to do and you're doing your gait training which is bullshit anyway um and yeah like just like talk it up hype it up yeah it, yeah any setting did you use the metaphor that they have new tires on their car and they can just get more mileage out of them Ooh, I like that. I, I just said new hip in general and we roll with it. But yeah, new knee or whatever. Now that you have this new knee. Yeah. Dope. DOP patients, all of the heart attack. Sometimes nerve. <laughs> like let's see if we can get you to another heart attack. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think that would be good. And I can maybe even throw in some like different ways of dosing to be like ways you can be creative with dosing to meet the patient's needs and kind of problem solve real world there are a couple of case studies so i think that hopefully gives you a little bit more direction um but if you want to talk it out more just text me or whatever uh yeah but i think this could wrap being up what do you know what kevin's talking about yeah, he sent me a paper on, I think it was like the, hold on, let me check. It's on my phone. It, it's not what you're talking about. I think it's more of like a big picture conversation of what, um, why people need to kind of load tissues, like just resistance training and its effects. Um, I don't know. I can link it.
the office thing? Oh. Uh, oh, there it is. I think I just broke my computer. <laughs> Did not catch any of that. What's the paper on? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm pulling it out. Hold on. It's on, I think, Bit. Oh, what the? I don't know where it went. Um, I'll find it, but it is not similar to what you're talking about. I think it's more just big picture concepts of what resistance training, why it's important for like a tissue perspective and like the positive effects from it. Awesome. Sweet. All right. Well, thanks Shelby for leading today. Thanks Taylor for joining the party. Stoked for next week. Does anyone yeah, have any? Really yeah, that was great. Does anyone have any final thoughts or questions? Dope. Well, I'm going to post it to the freaking Google Drive. Um, yeah. Thank you all again. Also, you know, any of you think of stuff during the week that you're like, oh my gosh, I want her to talk about this or I have this question. Just like shoot me a note and we got it. This stuff yeah. is so, so great. So props to Chris for getting it going. <laughs> yep. Sweet. All right. Y'all enjoy the rest of your weekend. All right. Bye y'all. Bye. Thanks guys. Thanks Shelby.